Okay, uh, I know that you're here since uh, 4, 4 p.m., right? Yeah. And that's a very long time, for us, so thank you for being there. And I promise you that this is, is going to be a very interesting, very, very interesting uh, presentation. So uh, my presentation today is about robotics and education development. How we can reshape the education by using programming and robotics. Uh, it was really uh, challenging to use a theme for the TEDx youth at SIS. And we, when we began uh, to brainstorm with our uh, uh, students and with our organizers, uh, Muhammad Walid, Bardia, Tala, so and we picked this theme, which is science and philosophy. It was really a very nice theme, but it was really challenging in order to choose the topic to talk about. But I believe that uh, it, it was just like an idea that uh, passed by my mind. A philosophy is about answering questions, and science is a uh, sorry. A philosophy is about uh, uh, asking questions. And science is about answering questions. So I believe that the key or the gate between philosophy and science is education. Because it is the merge between answering questions and uh, asking those questions. The bridge is education. I love Alice in Wonderland. I believe that this is one of the great stories. Uh, and I remember this quote said by Alice, she was running from the Queen of Hearts and then she was asking this caterpillar that uh, it was, uh, uh, I believe, smoking pipe or something. And then she was running and then uh, she asked the caterpillar, where to go, I'm running. And then he asked this question, where do you want to go? She said, I don't know. He said, if you, want, if you don't know where to go, anywhere can take you there. And I believe that this is the capstone question in education. If you don't know where to go, if you don't know where is your target, I believe that you're going to mess with your methodology and pedagogy. It will go in vain. You will be having no target, no aim, and no result as well. Let's look at the history of science. And let's begin with the atom. The atom has a very wonderful history. And it began at 460 BC. At 460 BC, Democritus hypothesized and gave the name of the atom. Can you imagine that the atom had its name at this time by Democritus? And then in 1869, Mendeleev was a, an OCD guy. He suggested that elements should be organized. They should be, uh, there should be a pattern for the elements. So he made a hypothesis, even there were lots of uh, vacant places, and he suggested that in the future, they are going to put some elements to be discovered in the future. And he was right. And then, uh, Big World discovered that there is a radioactivity uh, for the atom, followed by Rutherford, who discovered that there is something heavy inside the atom, and this is the heaviest part of the atom, a massive part that we call now the nucleus. And then the wonderful Niels Bohr, and I believe that he's the father of the quantum mechanics, although some people would say that Max Planck is the father of quantum mechanics, but I love Niels Bohr. He was a passionate person. He discovered, what he suggested, that the electrons are jumping from a level to another. And then Heisenberg suggested that there is an uncertainty principle. You cannot identify the place and the speed of a subatomic particle at the same time. Let's look at the history of universe. And I, the, when I say the history of universe, it is physics. Because we are the ones who suggested the history for the universe. And I know that this is a very egocentric approach, but I believe that physicists are the ones who gave you and us the secrets of the, the universe and the universe creation. So it began with this wonderful person, Copernicus. And he said that the Earth is not the center of the universe. It is the sun. And at that time, there was this geocentric approach that everyone was confirming. Everyone was saying that the Earth is the center, while the sun was the center. And he was the first person, along with uh, Geraldine Brogdon. They suggested that the Earth is not the center of the universe. And then this wonderful person that is giving our students some hard times in physics, Sir Isaac Newton who suggested that there is a gravitational forces between uh, planets and the moon. 
And he suggested that why the moon is not falling to the Earth because of the gravitational force between them. And then he suggested three wonderful laws of nature that we call the three laws of motion and the fourth law of gravitation. But he had a problem. He couldn't interpret and understand the meaning of gravity. So he could explain the effect of gravity, but he couldn't explain it. Until my favorite guy, <laughs> Albert Einstein. In 1905, it was a magic year for this guy. He made a progress in many fields. He suggested a special theory for relativity, a general theory for, rel for relativity. He suggested something called the photoelectric effect, and he got the Nobel Prize, by the way, for the photoelectric effect, not for relativity. This guy suggested that Isaac Newton couldn't interpret or couldn't understand the, the, the gravity, but he could. And I believe that one of our speakers said that he imagined that Einstein imagined the, the, the gravity as a world in a place or a curvature in a place and time. And he mentioned that, a place and time. That's why we, call, we are not calling it space only. We call it space-time because it is one fabric. And this is really interesting and dangerous as well. Because if you can bend time, if you can bend the space, time also is bent which suggests time trouble, right? So, this is the last guy in the, uh, the, this series of history in his board that he said that, well, maybe Einstein and Isaac Newton were, they're fine with physics, with the classical mechanics, and uh, the Einstein, he can interpret and explain the gravity. But I don't think that the physics that governs the heavens will govern the, or will, 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 will control the subatomic particles. So they invented another part of mechanics and they call it quantum mechanics. And it's a totally different mechanics that governs the subatomic particles. And I mean by, by the subatomic particles, the protons, electrons, and neutrons, and even the, 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 the more minute particles like quarks, and etc. So what is the secret of this journey? The history of atom, the history of physics, the history of chemistry, the history of geology, there is a common word, there is a secret. What is it? It is wondering. All of these people in the history, they ask questions and they try to answer them. And that's why we have sciences. And that's why we have philosophies. Because questions are answered. And there are lots of answers that need questions and explanations. And that's why we have sciences. I love John Dewey and I love this quote by John Dewey. He said that, give the people something to do, not something to learn. And when the doing of such a nature asks to demand thinking, learning naturally results. This guy was the founder. We can say that he's the founder of something that we call a PDL, that we're still using right now in the 21st century. The project-based learning. That learning should be having um, a nature of doing things. There is a fast-changing world. Let's compare the progress of technology versus education. And you will be amazed. This was the car in 1916. 2016, we have the driverless cars, Tesla cars. In 1979, this was the computer. 37 years later, we have tablets. This was the airplane in 1916. 100 years later, later we have such big monsters. This was the clearest picture for Pluto in, 19, the, in, in 1996. And now, in 1915, we have more clear pictures. And this was only after 19 years by the new horizon. This was the first launch for NASA in 1950. 66 years later, we have SpaceX. So, there were leaps between the, the past and the future of this world, especially in technology. Let's see how the education, what about the education? Has the methodology evolved? Let's see. This was the class in 1937. And this is the class now. What? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> There's a problem. There is a gap. So what is the problem? I believe that the problem has three dimensions. One of them is the crisis of passion. Our students are losing their interest. And they have the right sometimes. They have maybe domestic problems. I, I have a fight with my mom and dad. 
Maybe they have a very bad environment. I mean, a loud air condition. I mean, physical environment. Maybe they have, uh, they are an ACN or they have a certain learning disability. Maybe the teacher himself or herself has a dry lecturing style. Maybe the materials are difficult. Maybe they have no precocious knowledge. The second dimension was, is the, that they are feeling meaningless of education. They don't feel that they are going to use their education somewhere. There is no application. And you are always hearing the students saying that, where I'm going to choose or to use the, the physics equations, the math equations in the real life. And this, is, this is a common question that we, we, we hear from our students. Another dimension is the lack of the training. Most of the teachers, some of let's say that some of the teachers they have the lack of the training. They don't know how to cope with the new research and the new the new methodologies and pedagogical strategies. So some teachers are helpless. So the secret solution is changing the perception about education from methodology oriented to goal oriented. We need to think beginning with the goals. What is the purpose of education? And this is what, we, what, what I call the backward thinking. We need to think of the results before the steps. What do we need from education? This is an interview by one of the students, or the, he's a graduate basically, and the manager of the human resources is asking him, she's saying that, I see that you did well in school, but what three word skills do you have? The guy answered, tests. I can take tests. Unfortunately, this is the common attitude now. This is the common perception about education. Get the straight A's and you'll be fine. No, you're not going to be fine. You need some skills. What are the needed skills? What are the productive skills that we need? 21st century skills, and we call them the four C's. Creativity, communication, critical thinking, and collaboration. We need to get this in our educational practices. We need new technologies and solutions. We need STEM graduates. We need someone who knows science, technology, math, and in engineering. We have lots of problems that we didn't, we didn't solve yet. Can't you imagine that we couldn't find a final cure for cancer till this moment? Can you imagine that we couldn't find a final cure for AIDS or diabetes? This is a problem, man. There are lots of problems on our plate. And we need someone to solve that or to solve these problems. And finally, like Marian Edelman said, that education is for improving the lives of others and for leaving your community and the world better than you found it. And this is a global aim of education. So what are we going to do? As I've mentioned that, we're going to begin at the end of mine. And I love this guy, Stephen Covey, in his book, The Seven Habits for Highly Effective People. He said that we need, in order to solve any problem, in order to accomplish anything that you need, in order to attain any target in your life, you need to begin at the end of life. You need to know the result, and then you can plan for your steps uh, later on. We can't ignore that we are applying some standards that might be beneficial uh, in, in your pedagogical strategies or, or in, in your classroom, such as the NGSS or Next Generation Science Standards. And I love Next Generation Science Standards because they are three dimensions that are, with, with applying them in the classroom, the students are going to apply the, the, the practices, content, and cross-cutting concepts. They are going to see the world in different ways. For example, the cross-cutting concepts are the glasses of the scientists. How we see the world, how a scientist is going to see the world, and we see them through seven cross-cutting concepts such as patterns, cause and effect, scale, systems and models, and so on. In engineering practices, and there are eight practices, sometimes there are seven practices, and the, we call them the scientific method. If the student is applying the scientific method every now and then, I believe that we're training them to be having those uh, luggage of the 21st century skills that we need. PBL, project-based learning. Instead of telling people what they need to know and then memorizing them, and memorizing the basic facts and then having them in a quiz or an assessment, no, we're going to begin backward. We're going to begin with the problem and then identify the needs to solve these problems and finally learn and apply to solve this problem. And this is the cornerstone of the PBL. And as you can see, the PBL has different steps just like the scientific method. So, why the bottles? 
Why robotics is important? Why robotics can solve lots of problems? In robotics, you can have lots of dimensions together. A blending of learning and, and a blend of lots of skills and attitudes. Critical thinking, problem solving, engineering design, communication skills, leadership, programming, and collaboration. And this is in one robotics class. What are the tools that you can begin with as an educator or even as a student in a self-learning process? We can begin with Lego Mind Store, which is made of sensors and a brain that is easy to be programmed. It's a drag and drop programming. Vex Robotics, and we have two types of Vex Robotics that you can start with your son, your daughter, or with your students in your classroom. There are two types, Vex IQ and Vex ADR, and we're proud to have the national championship for two years now for the Vex ADR. Microtechnology, Raspberry Pi microprocessors, and this is a very small computer that you can program with your students, and there are lots of applications and projects that you can do with this pocket size computer, and it costs only $35. Arduino microcontroller, also this wonderful piece of technology, can utilize lots of programming such as C++ and even uh, Scratch, I believe that you can, you can program it with, with Scratch and C++ and Python even, Python programming. So it's a very useful tool to learn both technology and electronics and programming as well. Robotics virtual world, what if I can't afford a robot? I can't afford to buy a robot. You cannot force your students to buy robots. But you can do robots, you can play with robots in a virtual world, such as the robotics virtual world, that gives you some robots and different types of robots. And by the way, they offer the, the two types of robots that I have mentioned before, the, the uh, BEX, IQ, and EDR, and also they are offering the uh, Lego Mind Store. So you can pick the type of robot that you want and play with in this virtual environment. Programming. Uh, this is a huge program that we applied in our school, and I believe that this is our fourth year. And uh, alhamdulillah, this is our fourth year, and now we have more than 225 students that they completed their courses, four courses with one accelerated course in programming using this code.org uh, website. And I encourage you also to uh, create accounts and learn, educate yourself. Theme programming courses. There are billions of courses offered online, and this is also a program applied in our school. We call it the self-learning zone. And we have about uh, 25 to uh, 35 students this year only. They got their certificates in astronomy, Python programming, and AP physics this year using edX and uh, uh, Coursera and Khan Academy. What about student feedback? I'm still a teacher, and you're, you're knowing all of these from, our, from my own perspective, from my own point of view. What about students? How students can, uh, how this can reshape the, the, the students' activities or the students' knowledge? This is Mohamed Ali, he's a part of uh, our robotics team. He's going to talk about this. Uh, finally, there is, there, was, uh, there is this quote by the wonderful physicist uh, Carl Sagan. And he said once, somewhere, something incredible is happening. And I believe that if any educator, all of the educators and teachers, that they are working in the education field, put this coat in their pocket every day, and they look carefully at their students, at their brains, because they are reshaping their brains, I believe that something incredible is happening inside their brains. We just need to search for this wonderful thing in order to use it and in order to extract it and in order to make it a better uh, citizen and a productive citizen in this world. Thank you very much.